Wing Commander is a space sim made in the year 1990. You know, a game where you have full 3D control over a spaceship and you fly it around blowing up other ships for fun and or profit. I feel like I have to explain that part because uh, space sims aren't in a very good place right now and haven't been for a very long time. It wasn't always that way though. Space Sims were once a thriving genre with multiple high profile releases every year. So a few months ago, I found myself wondering, what happened? Was it survival of the fittest? Is there something inherent to the genre that keeps it from appealing to a wide enough audience to be financially viable? Was it a matter of some unfortunate design trends that all happened to converge at the worst possible time, scaring everybody off? Or does the fantasy of being a fighter pilot in space simply not resonate the way it once did? I've taken it upon myself to get to the bottom of it. And if we really want to figure this out, what better place to start than the beginning? You see, Wing Commander isn't just a space sim, it's THE space sim. The first one. Now, you could quibble over this if you want. There were earlier games that technically cover the same ground, but just look at them. Wing Commander is, to my eyes, the first game that is even vaguely recognizable as what you would actually want from something called a space sim. While I'm sure those games were great in their day, no new player in 2023 is going to look at them and see anything other than a relic. Hell, I'd bet a significant portion of the people watching would say the same thing about Wing Commander. It's arbitrary. Everybody's gotta draw the line somewhere. And for me, it's here. The thing is, I'm not coming to this from a place of nostalgia. Despite having grown up alongside Space Sims, I never actually played any of them at the time for various reasons. So when I observe these games in 2023, it's with a pair of fresh eyes, albeit with an understanding that these games are old, so while they do need to deliver on a fundamental level, you gotta give them a little bit of slack for lacking modern conveniences. So the story as I've heard it goes, programmer designer Chris Roberts was a guy who definitely isn't famous for anything in the present day. Anyway, in 1990, Chris Roberts and his pals at Origin Systems were kinda having similar thoughts to the ones I was having just a minute ago. The dream of having a 3D space game was real, but even the highest end computer hardware available to consumers at the time just couldn't make that happen at an acceptable fidelity or frame rate. So they figured out a workaround. Pre-render all the ships from a bunch of different angles, then render them as sprites in-game. Kinda like Doom, which was due to be released three years later by the way. That way they could have ships that looked way nicer than anything a home computer could handle at the time running at... Well, I guess this was considered an acceptable frame rate back then. In a tiny box, taking up less than half of the screen to help achieve that frame rate. It was a trying time, okay? And with that basic concept in mind, they set about making what they called the 3D Space Combat Simulator. It turned out okay. Alright, so let's talk about the game itself. Wing Commander is set in a universe where the spacefaring Terran Confederation is at war with the Kilrathi Empire, a warlike race of sentient cat people. I think the best way to describe the tone and feel is Star Wars meets Top Gun. It's what you might call light sci-fi, but without the space magic. And you're in the military and they won't let you forget it. You live in a barracks and spend all your free time at a bar, you get promotions if you follow your orders well, or you'll get stuck with the loser squadrons in a bad ship if you don't. You get medals of honor if you do especially well, and if you die, you get a full-on military funeral complete with a 21-gun salute. The first thing you see when you start a new game is... an arcade game? The timer runs out immediately and you get a game over, revealing that this is actually just a clever way to get you to enter your character's name for the high score. The original version had no default name, and people on the early internet took to calling him Blue Hair for obvious reasons, but the sequels decided on the canon name Christopher Maverick Blair, and later releases of the game include that name as a default, so that's who he is to me. 
And then, wait a minute. Did we just stumble into a 90s adventure game? Nowadays, I'd say it could use a few more colors, but the cartoony art style and detailed pixel art is honestly pretty charming. This bar is where you end up after each mission and is where you spend your downtime, chatting up your fellow pilots until it's time to get back to work. The guy on the left is Shot Glass, a recently retired pilot turned bartender, the first character you're likely to talk to, and the only one who's always in the bar since he's not on active duty anymore. Thanks to his occupation, he hears all sorts of news, and since he's had a long career, he has all sorts of things to say about the world and your fellow pilots. Basically, he's there to dump exposition on the player. He keeps it fairly brief and digestible, at least. At the table are two of your wingmen-to-be. Paladin is your old two days from retirement trope. Just like Shot Glass, he's old and experienced and has lots of advice for you as a result. He does distinguish himself a bit from the other pilots by having a few deeper thoughts on the war overall. And by being Scottish as hell. Angel is a nerd. Specifically, the preppy perfectionist kind. She's a real stickler for rules and regulations, and always going on about relative odds or shots to kill or some other important number. I guess it's good to have somebody worrying about that stuff. When you're ready, and you've done your saving and loading business in the barracks, it's off to the mission briefing. I was initially wary of having to sit through a briefing before every mission, but the way they're handled in this game isn't bad. Your commanding officer, Colonel Halcyon, keeps them short and sweet. Each one is typically only a minute or so long, and about half of that is dedicated to setting up the context for the mission and mixing in character moments, making it feel more like a cutscene than a lecture. In this case, he wants us to patrol the Enyo system for enemy fighter ships. And then it's off to space. Check out that really smooth animation. Must be rotoscope. The first thing I noticed after getting into the cockpit was that the flight controls feel great. Fighter ships are really agile in this game. They turn fast, have very snappy acceleration and deceleration, and get a handy afterburner for quick bursts of speed at any time. Despite how fast you turn, I actually have very little trouble controlling the ship with an analog stick, because the response to the stick is so smooth and precise, at least in the version that I played, which I'll talk about much later. There's no acceleration or other filtering to screw with your aim, no inertia to counter, no helpful auto-orientation features to stop you from turning wherever you want to, just a crisp one-to-one -one response to your input. If you really think about it, having the ships handled this well doesn't really fit something called a space simulator, but hey, I'm not complaining. You've also got some momentum to your movement. It's not quite Newtonian physics because you only have some momentum. It's just enough to let you pull off some sick drifting maneuvers without making it hard to come to a dead stop when you want to. Space sims have a bit of a reputation for overindulgent, overcomplicated control schemes. You know how it is. You load up one of these games, it's just a blast some fools, but not so fast. First, you gotta read the manual to figure out which button moves your S foils into attack position. It's F, by the way. Then memorize all 26 of the keys required to control your targeting computer. Switch to targeting computer. Switch all power to front deflector screen. Switch all power to front deflector screen. Uh-oh, he said it in the movie, so that means there needs to be at least one button dedicated to it in the video game. Ah, there it is. S. Oh, now I got to polarize my shields? I just wanted to shoot some TIE fighters. R2, try and increase the power. Oh, God, it never ends. Well, I'm happy to report that Wing Commander 1, at least, is not like that at all. The controls fit quite comfortably on a gamepad. If you're interested in using the control scheme I made for it, I'm planning to make a companion video explaining how to play this game in 2023, which would include setting up the controls with Steam or Rewazd. So hopefully there will be a link to that in the description by the time you see this, but if not, I can at least drop a link to my Rewazd profile for the game in case you're able to make use of that. 
Just a quick note, since I did bring it up, another feature unique to the version I am playing is the ability to turn off the cockpit graphics and get a full screen view. I know some people enjoy the immersive qualities of a huge cockpit, but I prefer being able to see. So if you're wondering what happened to the cockpit, there you go. You might have also seen the occasional clip of this game with voice acting, here or elsewhere, and yeah, there are a couple of versions that have it, but they don't play very well, so unfortunately we'll be getting the silent treatment until it's time to cover those. Now that we've familiarized ourselves with the basic flight controls, let's find something to shoot. Missions take place in these massive contiguous spaces that the game calls systems and task you with visiting a set of numbered nav points in order. Completing an objective at each one, or moving on to the next one if it turns out there's nothing there. If this sounds like it might be complicated, don't worry. Navigation couldn't be easier. There's a button you can press at any time to put a marker on your HUD telling you where to go next. If you wanted to, you could fly to it in real time, or go wherever you want, I suppose. But what you really want to do is hit the autopilot button, which will take you to wherever you're supposed to go next in a couple seconds, or tell you why it can't. It's actually shocking how intuitive and well-paced this game is considering that it's over 30 years old. I feel like I need to point out, this kind of design isn't normal for a game in 1990. When people talk about how games were simpler back in the day, generally the way that was achieved was by literally making the game simple. As in, they were easy to understand because there wasn't that much to understand about them. There were more ambitious, complicated games, of course, but they were correspondingly harder to understand and play. What we're seeing here is more akin to the way games are designed today, which is to have systems that are extremely complex, but give the player tools that make interacting with those systems simple. Oh, right. We were going to shoot something. And conveniently, at the first nav point, we run into some enemy ships. And right here we find the heart of the game. Everything revolves around this idea of flying around and shooting at these sprite-based ships. If this doesn't work, then nothing else matters. And you can probably guess by the fact of this video existing that, yeah, it works. On a fundamental level, this thing reads as a spaceship to me. I can tell where I am in relation to it, and shooting at it is fun. Combat in Wing Commander is mostly straightforward, but with a couple wrinkles that you might not be used to. Your primary means of offense are projectile weapons referred to as guns. Guns draw from a constantly recharging pool of weapon energy, so you can only fire them so much before having to wait to recharge, but never have to worry about running out of ammo for good. In addition, each ship comes with a very limited assortment of missiles. Defense is a bit more complicated. You've got three layers of protection. First, a constantly regenerating energy shield, then armor plating, and once both of those are gone, an internal HP value that once depleted results in your ship being destroyed. Damage to shields and armor is locational, so if you lose your rear shields and take some damage to your rear armor, everything on the front side will still be intact. Both player and enemy ships follow the same rules, or something very close at least. The ship you start the game in is called the Hornet. It's supposed to be a scout fighter, so it's lightly armed and armored, but fast as hell. The speed can be a bit of a mixed blessing, because when combined with the momentum-heavy physics, it's very easy to tap the afterburner intending to close the distance between yourself and an enemy fighter and end up fatally rear-ending them. The Hornet's primary weapon is a dual laser cannon, which shoots blaster-like bolts of energy. As you might expect from a starter weapon, it's the easiest to use, with the highest projectile speed and pretty good energy efficiency, allowing you to blast away without worrying too much about running out at a bad time. It works well enough against the weak ships you'll mostly be fighting in the early game, but its low damage output can't keep up with the shields and armor of anything tougher. For those tougher things, you do have missiles. But I should really say tougher thing, because the Hornet only carries two non-guided dart missiles, and one heat-seeking javelin, which is enough to take out one fighter. Maybe. The darts are a little awkward to use because, of course, you don't want to waste them, but surefire opportunities don't come along often, so a lot of the time I end up never using them. Still, there are times when they come in handy. Heat-seekers are interesting because the game really does simulate the heat-seeking part. 
they lock onto the heat from an enemy's engine wash. And if that enemy manages to shake the missile, it'll lock onto the next engine it sees, friend or foe. The likelihood of this actually biting you in the ass is very low, but it's a neat detail nonetheless. What's more gameplay relevant is the fact that it'll only lock on if it can actually see an engine. So it's not enough to just get a target in your sights, you need to stay behind it for long enough to acquire a lock. What's annoying is that if the enemy turns their engine out of your line of sight for even a single frame, it breaks the lock and you need to start the whole process over again. It really could have benefited from a grace period of a second or so to let you fire the missile or get the engine in sight again to maintain the lock, like the lock-on equivalent of coyote time. Although the Hornet is objectively the worst ship in the game in terms of its stats, I don't hate it. This is mainly down to the fact that it's the starter ship, and the developers know it. They don't expect you to take on the world in this thing, so it ends up being enough for most of the challenges it does face. Like these Dralthi at the first nav point, it may be the iconic box art fighter, but the Dralthi is the chump enemy type of this game. It's lightly armed with the same laser cannons as the Hornet, has poor defense, and is not particularly maneuverable. It goes down with very little trouble, provided you can hit it. Which is more of a problem than you might think. The key to understanding how combat works in Wing Commander is that hitting an enemy fighter is very difficult. You're trying to make these slow moving projectiles collide with these enemies that can move very fast in any direction they want, whenever they want. And to top it off, you can only shoot so many of them before your energy meter runs out and you have to wait for it to recharge. You can shoot the Hornet's lasers a pretty decent amount before they run out, but each shot is very weak, and the later guns that actually do an appreciable amount of damage rate it obnoxiously fast. The recharge speed is pretty fast by default, but whenever your shields are regenerating, so pretty often, your weapon energy slows to a crawl. All of this means that you really need to make every shot count. On the other hand, these factors also apply to the enemies trying to shoot at you. If you're getting shot at, just juke in any random direction you like and hit the afterburner button if you feel like you need an extra boost and you'll be safe. As such, some fights can end up going on for a while as stalemates, with neither side being able to land enough hits to seal the deal, especially early on when you haven't developed the skill required to hit things efficiently. Perhaps in part because it's so hard to land those shots, it's pretty satisfying when you do. Especially when you manage to catch them with a bunch of shots in a row, taking them from full health to dead in an instant. This is aided by an impressively detailed array of hit effects. Nowadays it's pretty widely understood that it's important for any game about shooting things to make sure that whatever you're shooting reacts to being shot in a satisfying way. Back in the 90s, this was not widely understood, especially among PC developers. And yet, in Wing Commander 1, we have a little explosion effect when you hit something. A distinct sound effect for when your shots are absorbed by an enemy's shield. Another sound for when you hit their hull, along with pieces of shrapnel flying off and some persistent sparks and fire trails to indicate that the ship has taken significant damage. I would have liked to have seen a visible shield flare effect, but given how far ahead of the curve we already are here, I can't complain. There's an uncommon attention to detail here that I appreciate. Now that we've dealt with those enemy fighters, it's off to the next nav point. On the way there, we get kicked out of autopilot because there's a hazard near. Looks like we're going to have to fly through an asteroid field to get there. This is an aspect of the game that is aged less gracefully than some of the others. Asteroids will come flying at you, and you need to dodge them until you're clear of the field. They could really mess you up if they hit you, and they hurt even more the faster you were going when you hit them, so it's generally a good idea to slow down to about 250 kps, which also helps you see them coming so you can swerve out of the way in time. If you do that, it's pretty safe, so it's really a test of patience more than anything else. Still, even the outside chance that you could be finishing a long and hard mission only to get blown away by a rock that came out of nowhere is just abhorrent to think about. For the most part, once you've got the hang of them, asteroid fields aren't awful, they're just... downtime. Where they become obnoxious is when they're placed so that you have to sit through them before getting to a really hard objective that you're gonna have to retry many times. You just know they did that on purpose too, the cheeky fuck. 
After we've cleared the asteroid field, we can go back into autopilot and see another enemy fighter type. The Salthi has the same weak guns as the Drawthi, but even weaker shields and armor. It can actually be quite a bit harder to take down though, because it's a lot more mobile and evasive. It does have a pretty funny weakness though. Due to a design flaw, it lacks the ability to turn right. That's not a bug or anything, that's a canonical behavior observed by characters in the game. Even despite this, Salties can still be annoyingly good at dodging my shots when they want to be. Once you've completed your objective at every nav point, it's time to come home to your carrier, the Tiger's Claw. If you're a new player, this part is the most likely to trip you up. First, you need to use the communication system. Opening your comms gives you a menu that lets you use the number keys to select who to talk to and what to say. In this game at least, you never have to count higher than four, so they fit nicely on the D-pad. Talking is something you end up doing surprisingly often in this game. You can give orders to your wingmen, taunt enemy ships to get them to aggro you, and at the end of every mission you need to ask the Tiger's Claw for permission to land. That's the easy part. Next you have to fly into the hangar bay in the front of the ship, which is trickier than you might think. You need to make sure you're actually going into the landing bay, or you'll bonk into the hull instead. Just take it slow and break off to try and find a better angle if it doesn't seem to be working. Eventually you get a feel for it. One nice looking landing sequence and a quick debriefing later and you're back in the bar, ready to do it all over again. Ah, some new faces. Spirit is Japanese, and this is an American game from the early 90s, so of course she's all about honor, duty, and shame. Well, she talks about those things anyway. She never gets around to actually following through on any of them, so in practice she's just a little uptight. But only a little. Hunter is a brash young up-and-comer with something to prove. Kinda like Maverick. No, not that one. The other Sorry, one. Goose, but it's time to buzz the tower. Much like the other Maverick, he's a bit of a prankster, but we don't get to see any of that ourselves either. For our next mission, Colonel Sama wants us to escort a Draymond transport out of the system. Escort. Oh, do I need to explain escort missions? You see, it's a mission that tasks you with ensuring the safety of some kind of AI-controlled character. You could probably figure that part out. The reason why you might not be familiar with them, or more specifically their reputation, is that in the past they were so universally despised by players that developers eventually got the message and pretty much purged them from video games. The reason they were so hated comes down to the fact that they could be failed for reasons outside of the player's control. The combination of the enemy and the escort target's AI can lead to all sorts of frustrating scenarios. Oops, Natalia ran in front of me while I was shooting somebody. Time to start the whole mission over. Did I mention that space sims are chock full of these? Escort is like the bread and butter mission type for these games. Okay, so this isn't looking good, but I am somewhat sympathetic to their use. Something you might notice when you play a lot of video games is that very few of them have any meaningful variation in mission objectives. It's actually surprisingly hard to come up with something other than go to a place and kill everything there. This is because many objectives that you might think are different end up boiling down to go to a place, remove the obstacles preventing you from doing a thing, kill all the guys, then do the thing. Now, they'll tell you otherwise. Cutscenes and voices in your earpiece will come up with all sorts of different reasons for why you're going to a place and killing all the guys there, but make no mistake, that is what you're actually doing in almost every case. The cutscene or animation that plays afterwards is set dressing, there to distract you from that fact. As bad as that sounds, it's actually fine. As long as the game does a good job of making it feel like you're doing different things, it's not so important that you're not actually doing them. One of the most important tools for keeping up this illusion in most games is level design. The variation in experience resulting from the traversal of different terrain can be enough to distract you all by itself. So what does this way too long tangent have to do with Wing Commander? 
Well, space sims don't get the benefit of this kind of level design because, well, you're in space. Empty space. There is no or very little terrain to shape the experience. So traditionally less used components such as mission design have to pick up the slack. Simply put, space sims need to mix up their rules-based mission design and objectives to a far greater degree than other genres or they risk becoming hopelessly repetitive. Which brings us back to the dreaded escort mission, which for better and for worse is unmistakably different from the status quo. So how do they work out here? Eh, it's kind of a crapshoot to be honest. To their credit, they did manage to remove some of the randomness from the equation. All escort targets start from a fixed position and move in a straight line to their destination, so the only variables are you and the enemy fighters trying to destroy it. Unfortunately, that's still a significant amount of randomness. If all of them decide to ignore you and go straight for the target at the same time, there's not much you can do. Well, you can taunt them to try to draw their aggro, but that itself is subject to RNG, and the chance of success does not seem particularly high in my experience. Even when they are paying attention to you, due to the way that combat works, time to kill could vary massively based not only on your skill, but on what your opponent decides to do. Sometimes they'll make a mistake that lets you kill them in an instant. Other times, they'll activate goblin mode and matrix dodge all your shots and every second you're busy with them is an opportunity for their friends to light up the target. Enemies that want to engage a transport or capital ship will park themselves next to it and start unloading their guns on it. It's pretty easy to tell when someone is going for it if you're looking, and if you're not, the sounds it makes will clue you in pretty quick. From there, it's up to you to shoot them until they either die or break off to save themselves. On the one hand, this is a good opportunity to get some easy damage on the attacker. On the other, every ship that does this is guaranteed to get at least a few shots off, and it really doesn't take much firepower at all to down most cap ships. So when you have several enemy fighters doing hit and run attacks, the margin of error can be extremely thin. The worst example of this is the game's most infamous mission which has you escorting a captured Kilrathi carrier into human custody. Even with my desperate intervention, the enemy pretty consistently ends up destroying the thing in less than 10 seconds after I arrive, which is just ridiculous. Most of the other escort missions aren't nearly that bad, but the low HP of the things you're protecting always makes it feel like you're only one unlucky break away from getting screwed over. Seeing as this first one is meant to be your introduction to the concept, it's unsurprisingly not bad at all. Keep a couple waves of weak enemies away from the Draymond until it gets to the designated jump point so it can warp away, and you're done. Back on the Tiger's Claw, before we can hit the bar, the Colonel wants to see us in his office. We're moving on to a different system, and he's reassigning us to a better fighter ship. The fact that we're changing ships is a sign that we've been doing well. Wing Commander is broken up into a number of what it calls series Each series has you flying between two and four missions in a particular ship, usually in and around the system the series is named after. Finish the series, and depending on how the war has been going, the next series will be different. If you completed enough objectives, not necessarily all, but enough, you'll be assigned a better ship and put on the good path. And if not, you'll be demoted to a worse ship and sent on a worse path. Repeat until you get to either a good or bad ending. This non-linear approach and softer punishment for failure is commendable, but there are a few quirks to the system. The requirements for success in a series aren't spelled out at all and seem to differ from series to series. There were some where I was able to succeed despite having failed to complete objectives in multiple missions, while others sent me straight to the bad path after having failed just one measly objective. Another oddity is that the missions on the worst path tend to be harder than the ones on the better path. This is mainly due to the fact that the ships they stick you with in these losing series really suck, and expecting you to do anything beyond what the easy missions in the first few series have in them is unreasonable. Whatever the reason, making a game get harder in response to a player performing poorly is generally considered a no-no. I've heard people say that it makes sense for the losing path to be harder because you're in a worse, more desperate situation. 
But I would argue that having the outcome of an entire war hinge on the moment-to-moment -moment performance of a single fighter pilot is absurd. And maybe I'm just not cut out for leadership, but if someone under my command was underperforming, I would respond by assigning them to less important, less demanding missions until they got better. On the other hand, if all you want to do is play the game and get the good ending, it's actually quite easy. As you can see, you get many chances to get back on the good path, and in fact the only time you're ever truly locked into one path is at the end when the paths converge into the final two good and bad ending series. As long as you can win a couple missions, you can get yourself back on track. According to Game Facts, you can literally just immediately eject on every mission they send you on, and for some reason they'll keep giving you more ships to throw away. Keep doing this, and as long as you pause your spree to do four specific missions, you can get the good ending. Talk about a lenient system. Origin would go on to regret making all of those different paths, because most players would reload when they failed an objective, and therefore never see most of the losing series, making them kind of a waste. Now, when I said we were getting a better ship, eh... When talking about the scimitar, better is a relative term. Even the developers seem to agree with me that this thing sucks. I'm not sure they fully understand why though. The official line is that it's slow and clumsy, but it's not really. It is true that it turns slower and has a lower speed than the other fighters, but not by enough to really matter. To have your wingmen tell it, the enemy will be flying circles around you, but in reality it has no trouble keeping up with them if you use the afterburners. So what's the problem then? It's this piece of trash right here. The mass driver is technically the highest DPS gun in the game, or would be if you could fire it for more than two seconds without running out of energy. The real cherry on top is that the scimitar shields take almost twice as long to regenerate as those of the other ships. Not only does this make them bad at shielding you, but if you remember, it also affects the energy going to your guns. You end up being so starved for energy in this thing, just barely able to sputter out a couple shots every few seconds once a battle gets going, which just feels atrocious. The mass driver's projectiles are also the slowest moving in the game, which is deceptively important. Given how hard it is to hit anything in general, having your projectiles move 30% slower makes it that much more of a problem. For missiles, the scimitar gets the hornet's loadout plus two more heat seekers, for a total of two darts and three javelins, which is enough to definitely take out one fighter. Great. Then there's the matter of the armor plating that's supposed to make up for the scimitar's lack of speed. Let's just say it's a good thing that the mobility issue isn't all it's cracked up to be, because armor doesn't count for jack in this game. Knight here has no idea what he's talking about. Having double the armor of the Hornet means it'll protect you from one or two additional shots at most. Shields are what actually matters, and the scimitar does not have enough of those to make me feel safe. In a raw technical sense, the Scimitar is a better ship than the Hornet, but that's not the whole story. After the first series, the game takes the kid gloves off and starts introducing some actually dangerous enemy types, and the Scimitar is not the ship you want to be in when fighting these guys. And would you look at that? Some more new faces in the bar. Iceman was the Tiger's Claw's star ace before we came along. In addition to being highly skilled, his demeanor is always calm and professional. He hates to kill Rathi even more than your average pilot, and seems to enjoy his work a little too much. At least the other pilots seem to think so. Knight is... well, his thing is supposed to be that he's unremarkable. An ordinary pilot. Kind of a straight man character. The problem is that most of his fellow pilots aren't really out there enough for that to be a distinguishing characteristic on its own. So he's just a regular guy, I guess. This time around, the Colonel wants us to patrol the McAuliffe system. Well, we know how to do that. The one new thing here, other than a chance to get used to the scimitar, is a minefield. I actually find these to be a lot less of a problem than the asteroid fields, because unlike the asteroids, the mines don't move. They have a bigger hitbox to compensate, but they also don't do as much damage. I don't think I've ever died to a mine in this game.
Back in the bar, we have the last two characters. Maniac is like the anti-angel. He just hates the rules, doesn't like anyone telling him what to do. And he's also quote unquote unstable, which just means he's a little crazy in a non-specific way. Stop me if you heard this one before. Boss Man is an old and experienced pilot with lots of wisdom to share. According to the manual, he used to be a reckless go-getter like Hunter before the loss of some of his comrades scared him straight, but we never even see a hint of this side of him in the actual game, so there's not that much to separate him from Paladin or Shot Glass. Now that I've introduced all of them, this seems like a good time to talk about one of the game's most touted features, Wingman. I've glossed over it until now, but every time you go out on a mission, you're joined by a single wingman who is under your command. Each series pairs you with a specific wingman. In Enyo, I was flying with Spirit, and here at McAuliffe, I'm with Paladin. They put a lot of effort into expressing each wingman's character via their AI behavior. Older pilots like Paladin might be inaccurate and slow on the draw, while particularly skilled ones like Iceman will fire quickly and accurately and Maniac will blast everything with reckless abandon and no regard for whether you might be in the way. This also applies to how they respond to your commands. Angel will always follow orders, while Maniac never will. And a show-off like Hunter might refuse an order to retreat unless his ship is literally on fire. Meanwhile, a more level-headed guy like Knight might just decide to do it on his own. Some of that may be apocryphal. But, the fact that it's hard to tell is a point in Wing Commander's favor. To be honest, I didn't really feel the need to micromanage them with specific orders. The heat of battle is no time to be fumbling with a menu-based radio, and I figure as long as they're keeping at least one enemy fighter off my back, they're doing their job. And if they manage to get a kill or two, even better, provided you're not trying to hog all the kills so you can get medals and optimize your KDR to stay on top of the leaderboard. The command I did find myself using was the one that tells them to actually go out and attack the enemy rather than uselessly flying behind you, which they absolutely will keep doing until you tell them not to. Come on, buddy, just do it! I know you want to, on the count of the fact that you won't shut up about it. I don't know why they felt the need to make the wingmen so lacking in initiative. I guess they wanted to make you feel like a big man bossing these guys around, and that wouldn't really happen if you didn't at least have to give some kind of order sometimes. Strangely, once you do set them loose, the game seems to remember this and you don't need to tell them again, even on subsequent missions or loading your save, until the next time you exit the game and load it up again. Now, I'm pretty sure this is a bug, but I won't tell anybody about it if you won't. Let's let this be our little secret, okay? Wingmen are generally pretty good at taking care of themselves, if not great at actually getting kills. Even still, death can come very fast in this game, so everything can be going fine one moment, then one wrong turn, and boom, no more paladin. And I mean really no more, because if a wingman dies, that's it. They're dead for good. They even get a funeral just like you do. You'll be flying solo in any future missions that would have involved them, and they won't show up in the bar anymore. I don't like this feature. The fact that a wingman can die basically guarantees that they can't participate in the story in any meaningful way, because any plot points that might involve them wouldn't be able to happen if they were dead. The fact that all but two of the main characters are like this does not bode well for the story. Nobody is allowed to do anything important, because that thing wouldn't get done if they were dead. I also just like these people, despite how it may seem, and don't want them to be removed from the game. Nothing interesting happens if you go on without them. You just don't get to see whatever they would have contributed from that point on. Whenever a wingman died, I would quit and reload my save. Would anybody have really questioned it if they just auto-ejected when their ship was destroyed? Anyway, let's take Paladin out to destroy an enemy capital ship. Better hope nothing happens to him. Boss Man's advice here is actually pretty solid. You're going to want to clear out all the enemy fighters before focusing on a cap ship, because it really helps to have the breathing room to sit there and shoot them without having to worry about getting blown away from behind. 
and it looks like the fighters protecting this one are a new type. It's almost disappointing that the Krant has the same piddly laser cannons as the previous two fighter types. You'd think they would have moved past that by now. What it does have is way more armor and shields. This thing is beefy. It can take quite a few hits before going down, but its lack of armament prevents it from posing too much of a threat. Now that the escort has been disposed of, it's time to take on the capital ship itself, and... Uh, where do I begin? Remember when I said the 2D sprite-based ships fundamentally worked? That was a bit of a lie of omission. What I should have said was that the sprites are great at depicting fighters, ships that are roughly comparable in size to your own. For bigger ships, however, it's a complete disaster. The first problem is that the illusion doesn't work. They just look tiny. I'm supposed to believe that this is a huge carrier that could house multiple wings of fighters? It looks like it can barely fit the bar. The more serious issue arises when you get close. The limited number of rotations and course scaling can make it difficult or impossible to tell where they are in relation to you, or which direction they're facing. Was my praise of the hit effects misguided, or is the sprite just lying to me about where the ship actually is? There's a huge capital ship in front of me right now. Can't you see it? If I shoot right now, will I hit this ship I'm trying to protect, or the attacker who's about to blow it up? Every interaction with these larger ships is awkward and janky, so maybe that's why they made the hostile ones kind of a joke. Capital ships can have one of two kinds of attack. A single shot, slow firing laser turret that can fire in any or at least most directions, or a flak gun which is basically an AOE attack that slowly damages anything in a radius around it. But both of these are so weak that they can barely keep up with your shield regeneration. Characters in the game talk about saving your missiles for the cap ships because your guns aren't powerful enough, but that's actually not true at all. You could literally just sit behind them, provided you could figure out where that even is, and unload into them with your guns until they're space dust without any real danger to yourself. This also means that they're all essentially the same fight, with the only meaningful difference between the various classes being the number of hits it takes to destroy them. You know what? I'm putting my foot down right here. The very idea of a small fighter taking down a supposedly massive capital ship is inherently ridiculous. And having you do it in these games is a mistake. You're just never going to get me to believe that shooting your dinky little lasers at this massive thing is ever going to do any significant damage to it. It's like unloading your SMG into the side of a tank. The entire exercise just looks stupid and is never fun to do. I'm not saying the capital ships shouldn't be depicted at all, or that you shouldn't be able to interact with them by taking on the smaller individual components like turrets. Just leave actually destroying the whole thing to something other than a tiny little fighter ship. I'd love to have a game prove me wrong with a fun and well thought out take on fighting capital ships, but I've yet to see one. Every game I've seen try it so far has gotten some aspect of it horrendously wrong and ended up frustrating or boring. I think the designers of these games are afraid the player will get bored if they aren't the ones to personally do absolutely everything. But I, for one, would much rather do something to support an AI-controlled ship that actually looks like it should be able to take one of these things on, if that's what it came to. Anything other than parking next to it and scratching the paint until it inexplicably explodes. Some capital ships, like the one on this mission, are here to fight. But on other missions, you might come across one that's on its way to a jump point. So the onus is on you to take out all the fighters as fast as you can, then destroy the cap ship before it can escape. Despite how awkward actually fighting them is, I don't actually find destroying capital ships as an objective type to be all that bad. It's basically either some time pressure or an AOE hazard to deal with while taking on the escorting fighters. The amount of time you have before they get away always seems reasonable. Like it genuinely is your fault if you can't do it in time. And if all else fails, you can always throw caution to the wind and go for a Hail Mary attack if you think you've been taking too long. And believe it or not, that's the last unique gameplay scenario Wing Commander has for us. Technically, there's also a recon objective where you just have to target a specific capital ship and then you can leave, but since capital ships are a joke, you might as well just blow it up while you're there. 
The game continues to introduce new enemy types and mixes things up with variations on the objectives, but fundamentally every mission involves seeking and destroying enemy fighter wings, escorting friendly capital ships, or destroying enemy ones. It doesn't seem like a lot when you put it all together like that, because it isn't. But hey, you gotta remember, this was the first one. And honestly, across a single playthrough of the campaign, I think it's enough. Just barely. By mixing and pacing those few elements out in various ways, they were able to avoid the feeling of repetition just long enough to make it to the end. I don't think they could have gone any longer than that though. I don't feel any pressing need to go back and check out the series that I missed. For the final mission at McAuliffe, we need to separately escort two Draymond tankers, each to a different jump point. But watch out, there's an enemy ace gunning for them. This seems as good a time as any to talk about the enemy AI. The AI for fighters in this game is genuinely impressive, even if you don't consider that it's over 30 years old. This is absolutely not the kind of game where the enemies will just passively allow you to blow them up by the dozen. Every fighter is dangerous, and taking them down requires effort and focus. I talked about how hard it was to hit the enemy before, and a big part of it is that the AI flies a mean dogfight. Enemy fighters do a good job of staying out of your crosshairs and getting behind you when they want to, but still have intentionally designed weaknesses to exploit. Don't get the wrong idea here. There's still no match for you one-on-one, -on -one, or at least, they're no match for me. But they're very dangerous in groups, and they make you work for that victory, which is what you want from this kind of game. They'll even run away if you critically damage their ship or they accomplish their objective. Your job is to complete whatever your objective is, not to chase down every stray fighter, so you can just let them go without consequence. But if you really want to rack up kills for the leaderboard and don't mind wasting a ton of afterburner fuel, you can take them out before they get away. You can tell that the occasional mistakes are intentional, because aces don't make them, and will give you no quarter. There's one for every class of enemy fighter, and they typically serve as a boss fight of sorts at the end of a series. They're noticeably harder to hit and more aggressive than the regular versions of their ships. They also cheat a little, with way more shields and armor than their ship class would normally have, like literally more than some capital ship sometimes. But hey, boss fights are boss fights. In a way, aces are the only real opportunity for characterizing the enemy, as they're the only named enemy characters in the game. Your wingmen will talk them up, telling you all about how ruthless and skilled they are, and the aces themselves regale you with unique taunts as you fight them. I'm not sure why this elite veteran with almost 100 confirmed kills is still flying a piece of crap like the Salty, but everybody has their preferences. I think it's a shame they don't come back in future missions if they escape their first encounter with you. It would have been cool to have a nemesis to contend with. After we get back, we're treated to one of two cutscenes. Gilrathi marines invade a scientific colony on the planet McAuliffe 6, and if you did poorly, the unarmed scientists are all killed. Or if you did well, the scientists somehow managed to overpower and capture their attackers. Good for them, I guess. I did well, so with those scientists saved, we're off to the Gimli system, and I can finally ditch the scimitar for the Raptor, the first ship that isn't horribly deficient in some way. You can put the previous two ships and the last two on either side of a dividing line. On the one side, you've got severely underpowered ships that make the game a chore to play if you have to take on anything other than the weakest enemies in them. And on the other side, you've got the good ships that are actually capable of getting things done. The most notable change is that it has two sets of guns. In addition to the mass driver, you also get a pair of neutron guns, which are sort of halfway between the mass driver and the laser. The important thing is that you can activate full guns and shoot both at the same time. You'll run out of energy even faster than you did with the mass driver alone, but the amount of damage you can dish out all at once makes it worth it. Now, instead of having to constantly follow behind an enemy nipping at their heels, you can wait for the right moment and absolutely shred them with a full burst. It's super satisfying to pull off, and it makes taking down enemy fighters so much easier than it is in the Scimitar or Hornet. For missiles, in addition to two of the usual heat-seeking javelins, we also get a couple of image recognition spiculums. These work like your typical video game missiles. 
Aim at the target until you get tone, then fire and forget. Very nice. Their simplicity and reliability make them my first stop for any missile related needs. If that's not enough, you also get one Pylum FF for friend or foe. This one you can fire without a lock on and it'll go off to ruin someone's day on its own. This does mean that you can't choose who the missile will target though. And one missile hit will only really do enough damage to take out an enemy's shields. So if it decides to go after some bozo you weren't even fighting yet and you don't get to him before his shields recharge, it could end up being a waste. And finally, you get a mine. Well, they can't all be winners. It's worth noting that this is the heftiest missile loadout you'll get access to in the game. And even then, it's really not that many. It's just enough to even the odds in one high pressure situation. I don't think it would have hurt to let you carry a few more or to have some kind of restocking mechanic because you have so little of them that they barely factor into the game as is. The other big differentiator is the shields. The scimitar technically had stronger shields than the hornet, but it's not until the raptor that it finally feels like enough. Shields regenerate constantly and very quickly in this game, so they make a big difference in soaking up the damage you'll take, but only the Raptor and the final ship have enough that you can reliably take a hit or two without immediately losing them and suffering permanent damage. I really dislike how fragile you are in the first two ships. Typically a well-designed game will treat small mistakes as something that only leads to failure in aggregate over time, while leaving instant punishment to only the biggest screw-ups. When you're flying those less protected ships, sometimes even the tiniest mistake can take you from pristine to dead in an instant. When that happens at the end of a long and hard mission that you've flown perfectly up to that point, it can be infuriating and doesn't leave you with any kind of lesson other than be more perfect next time, I guess? The one or two extra mistakes that actually having an appreciable amount of shields affords you in every encounter are a real game changer and they make flying the two good ships so much more fun than the two bad ones. It even opens up new strategies. There's locational damage and your front shields operate independently from the ones protecting your back. When there are a lot of enemies it can be tough to find an opening, but you could intentionally tank a couple hits on your back shields in order to make one then turn around and keep it safe while it recharges. Only the two good ships have enough shields for this to be even worth considering though. Our first opportunity to take the Raptor out for a spin is a mission to defend an Exeter class destroyer. Man, it feels good to fly this thing. It's like I've taken my training weights off or something. Once we get to the Exeter, we find another new enemy type. The Jolthy looks kind of similar to the Krant when viewed from some angles, but you don't want to make that mistake. This thing is basically a flying tank. It's very slow and easily outmaneuvered, but if you do get in front of it, it has six guns that it fires at the same time, which is a nice way to introduce you to the wonders of constructive interference. Jesus Christ, my ears! I've lowered the volume somewhat to protect yours, but trust me, you're going to want a volume knob handy if you play this game yourself. Aside from that, four laser cannons and two neutron guns are enough to seriously damage the good ships, or just straight up one shot a scimitar or hornet. It also has the most shields and armor of any basic fighter type in the game, but it's so easy to hit that it doesn't last as long as you'd think. They're no match for the Raptor, just make sure you stay away from their front side. The next mission is a bog standard patrol for enemy fighters, but with a twist. You and Angel get to test drive a pair of prototypes for the final player ship, the Rapier. It's mostly the same as the Raptor in the ways that count. Just like the Raptor, you have two sets of guns, but this time you get laser cannons instead of mass drivers. I prefer it this way because you get a few more shots off before running out of energy, and they're more likely to hit, but it's mostly the same. You get a weaker missile loadout than the Raptor with two darts, two pylums, and one spiculum, but as I said before, you could never truly rely on them anyway. 
The rapier has less armor plating than the raptor, or even the scimitar, but who cares when you get better shields than even the raptor? Your wingmen make a big deal out of this, but it's really a non-issue. Trust me, you are much safer in this thing than you are in a scimitar. Oh, and it's really fast. Turns out it's not just us trying out a new toy. The final nav point has a pair of the final enemy fighter type to match ours. The Gratha is no joke. These fighter jet looking things have it all. Strength, speed, and armor in one complete package. Its pair of mass drivers and laser cannons aren't as devastating as the Jalthi six guns, but they still pack a major punch, and unlike the Jalthi, it makes its comparatively lighter but still pretty tough shields and armor last way longer by dipping, ducking, and diving away from your shots. The later missions are chock full of these, so get used to them. And with the top of the line fighter for each side debuting at the same time, we've now seen every meaningfully unique gameplay element. Technically, there are some enemy capital ship types we've yet to see, but the experience of fighting them is identical to what we've seen before. I didn't consciously notice it until I went over the game with a fine-toothed comb for this video, but they've managed to introduce at least one new thing in each successive mission up to this point, which probably not coincidentally is about halfway through the game. From this point on, it's all down to remixing those elements in various ways while turning up the heat with increasingly difficult compositions of enemy fighter waves. Following the game's mission by mission has been a useful framing device up to now, but this is probably a good time to zoom out a little. Maybe just bring up some topics without a prompt, like, uh... One problem I've noticed that space sims often have is that it can be extremely hard to tell where things are when it matters. You'll be wrapped up in some huge chaotic melee when all of a sudden your commander starts shouting in your ear about how you need to protect the USS defenseless. But there's just one problem. Where is it? Getting your bearings in space is a uniquely hard problem because you've got six degrees of freedom you need to cover when looking around in a massive, fully 3D environment with little to no visible landmarks to orient you. You can't even tell up from down since it's all relative in space and all the other ships are constantly moving around across distances fast enough that they become impossible to see. Not because of draw distance, but because they are literally far enough away from you that they would be imperceptible to the human eye. It's a problem that I think is solvable, but it absolutely requires effective tools to help you find what you're looking for, and I'm sad to say that most space sims do not give you what you need here. And so you spin around hopelessly trying to locate the defenseless, as the screams of its dying crew members reverberate around your cockpit. It's a massive pain point for these games, which is why I don't think any discussion of one of them is complete without talking about what, if anything, it did to deal with this issue. So how well does the first one fare in this regard? Better than you might think. As you might expect, the tools the game gives you for selecting and locating targets are pretty basic, but so is everything else. The thing is, you're not getting into epic fleet battles involving hundreds of ships here. Every engagement only involves a small number of participants, which keeps things simple, and that simplicity ends up being greatly to its benefit. Your main tool for finding things is this radar display. I sometimes find the radars in these kinds of games, which have the unenviable task of trying to consolidate the positions of 3D objects on a 2D screen to be incomprehensible or borderline useless, but this one was immediately intuitive for me. The way they accomplish this genuinely impressive feat is by discarding most of the information and focusing on what matters most. You could probably venture a guess that this red dot is an enemy ship, so how do you get it in your sights? Simply turn until the dot is in the center, and you're looking at it. Easy. What it sacrifices to be this simple is any information on how far away any of these dots are, or where they are in relation to each other. But since there are never enough of them to be truly overwhelming, you can figure that stuff out just by pointing towards your target and looking at what's around it. Both enemy and friendly capital ships get their own distinct color, and I don't think you ever encounter more than two capital ships of any kind at a time. So I never had any real problems figuring out where they were when I needed to. Sometimes less is more. One area where the game's age does show is in what I'm going to call combat awareness. Pretty much every fight in this game involves you and your wingman going up against at least three enemy fighters at once, usually more. 
The radar is great at showing you where to shoot, but what about defending yourself? Without a usable third person view or any HUD indicators, your only way of knowing when someone is shooting at you is to listen for it. This works to some extent, but there are limitations. This game was released in 1990, remember. You can hear the enemy shooting at you, but there's no positional audio at all, not even stereo, nor is there any distance attenuation. So the shots from your wingman dogfighting someone so far away that you can't even see them sound exactly the same as the ones coming out of your own ship. Additionally, only so many sound effects can play at the same time, so anytime a lot of shots are going off at once you just kinda have to assume that some of them are coming from behind you in case they really are. You do get a little indicator light to tell you when an enemy missile is locked onto you, but with no warning sound to draw attention to it, it's very easy to miss during hectic moments. There's definitely some room for improvement here. The game has a couple simulation-y elements that initially gave me pause, but turned out to be not so bad once I got to know them. The first is the fuel meter. Who wants to worry about their mileage in space? In practice though, although it does very slowly go down for basic flight, the only thing that really moves the needle is using your afterburners, and as long as you're not just boosting everywhere for no reason and personally chasing down every single fighter that tries to run away, you're unlikely to run out of fuel before the end of even the longest missions. You aren't stranded if you do run out either. According to the manual, your top speed is supposed to be severely reduced, but in my experience, that's not true. The only thing that running out of fuel does is prevent you from using the afterburner, which is not a great situation to be in, but I would hardly count myself out over it. The other big one is the damage system, which I have mixed feelings on. The way it works is, any attack that makes it through your shields and armor will damage the various components of your ship in addition to its overall HP. What breaks is partially based on where you were hit and partially determined by random chance. There are all sorts of different things that can be affected. Damage to your engines reduces your max speed. Your fuel tank could take a hit and spill out some of its contents. You could lose your shield generator with obvious consequences, or get a screen full of static when you try to use your comms, and so on. It's kind of fun just to see all the different things that could break. There really are a lot of them. Where the problem comes in is that not all of them are equal. Losing access to your missile tracking system is one thing. Trying to go without your guns or your shield generator is something else entirely. Depending on something that is at least partially based on RNG, taking damage could be a minor inconvenience, an interesting challenge that might be fun to work around, or crippling to the point where you might as well end the mission right there. There is an automatic repair system, but you don't get any information on how it works other than the occasional message that so-and-so has been fixed. The only things I know for sure are that it won't fix anything that has been completely destroyed, and that it takes a very long time to fix the things that it actually can work on. Oh, and the repair system itself is one of the things that could break, of course. Damage is also supposed to apply to your enemies, although it's pretty hard to tell, to be honest. Are they running away because they literally can't shoot me anymore? I guess that would make sense. When it works, which is admittedly a lot of the time, the system can add a little bit of spice to the experience, keeping you on your toes and forcing you to improvise in the face of what otherwise might be a rote situation. Even being completely crippled can occasionally lead to fun player stories. Like the time I lost every single gun and missile on my ship, leaving me completely defenseless, only able to hope that my wingman could finish the rest of the mission on his own. But boss man, the absolute legend, actually came through and brought both of us home with all objectives completed. Stories like that are undoubtedly the reason why they made the system, and it really does add to the experience. But I think it could do with a bit of tweaking, something as simple as making it impossible to permanently destroy your guns and shield generator. Or at least making it less likely to happen would go a long way. Okay, so I've gone over all the various mechanics and systems by now, but how does it all fit together? I think a good question to ask when trying to determine that about a game is, how do you win at it? What are the considerations you need to make when the going gets tough? What actually matters? 
Well, something to keep in mind is that it's not hard at all to fight off one or even two enemy fighters, as long as you have a wingman. It's when you get outnumbered that the difficulty comes in. Because it's so damn hard to hit things that don't want to be hit, actually doing so means steadily aligning yourself with the target, or in other words, flying in a straight line. If there's anyone behind you, that's their opportunity to take you out. And because half of the ships are so fragile, you really don't have the choice of tanking a little damage in exchange for a kill. You need to break off in this situation if you want to survive. This means that every additional enemy you add is an exponential increase to the difficulty of the encounter. If two is no big deal, three is a real fight, four is dangerous, five is crazy, and if you ever run into six or more enemy fighters at the same time, uh... Good luck! When you're fighting a lot of enemies at once, they're going to be shooting at you almost all the time and you'll be forced to focus on avoiding their shots rather than attacking them. But every once in a while there will be a gap. A small period of time in which nobody is shooting at you. Maybe they're all recharging their guns or something. I don't know. These gaps are your opportunity to get a few shots of your own in. Hopefully enough to destroy one of them, which will massively shift the odds in your favor. With each enemy fighter you down, the length and frequency of these opportunities of attack will increase. That's why it's absolutely essential to recognize these chances to act when they come and take maximum advantage of them. The primary skill tested by Wing Commander is shooting, quickly aligning the crosshairs, predicting the enemy's movements, leading your shots, and conserving your energy for the right moment. Defensive play, on the other hand, is pretty bare bones. Even against overwhelming odds, it's not very difficult to avoid damage if you just keep tapping on the afterburner in random directions. But you can't stall forever, and when it comes time to seal the deal, it's just so goddamn hard to hit anything that there's little to no room for defending yourself while you do it. Make no mistake, there's a high skill ceiling for landing those shots, but it's tough to shake the feeling that it's the only thing that really matters. The better you are at shooting, the better you can take advantage of those short opportunities to buy yourself some breathing room. The quicker you can take down enemy fighters, the less time they have to destroy your escorts, and the more time you have to take out theirs. At the end of the day, it all comes down to making those little orbs intersect the enemy hurt box, and I can't help but feel like there should be more to it. Even so, landing those shots is satisfying enough to carry the experience on its own. It's simple. But simple doesn't mean stupid. The simple one-to-one -one relationship between your inputs and the flight controls make them a perfect fit for a game about aiming. The only things that matter are your skill and that of your target. So when it all comes together, when you're in a ship that starts with R and you've got multiple bogeys on your tail and your shields are down, your target breaks left, but you're ready for them with a full salvo. It can be sublime. While it does use the traditional method of having a looping background theme per area when you're off duty, once you get into space, Wing Commander's Virtual Orchestra mostly plays more like a programmatic film score, dynamically adjusting itself based on context to fit whatever action is happening on screen at the moment. You might be thinking, oh, a dynamic soundtrack, like when there's an ambient track and then it switches to the active version when you get into combat. And yeah. But it's so much more granular than that. They've got a unique track for when you're being tailed. For when you're tailing someone. When you've got a missile locked on to you. when your wingman is in trouble. When your wingman is dead.
when a battle is particularly intense. And before we had... There was... Outside of battle, we have different main themes depending on what kind of mission we're doing, with transitions that vary based on how well the mission has been going. I got used to listening for the successful variations of the returning theme when arriving back at the Claw to reassure myself that I had done well. Although, weirdly, the failure version will always play when returning from escort missions. I'm not sure if it was intentional or not, but it always kept me on edge, which speaks to the effect of the music when it is playing something appropriate. Wing Commander's soundtrack isn't one that I'm going to be listening to outside of the game, but while playing, it fits the action like a glove. It's not always perfect. Like, whoa, calm down there. I only killed one guy. There are still three others. Are you really going to make that big of a deal out of every single one of them? Apparently you are. And that seems like a bit much. It also seems to get confused in some situations where multiple tracks could apply, so it just keeps awkwardly switching between them before they can get going instead of letting one take priority over the others like it should. Outside of those minor issues, it really does feel precisely appropriate to what you're actually doing 90% of the time, like a film score. So, mission accomplished. Now, I'd been summarizing the story up to the halfway point, so you probably want to know how it ends. After Gimli, some saboteurs blow up a Kilrathi military installation somewhere in the Brimstone system. Or they don't. Wait, the Brimstone system? Where's that? Has anyone even mentioned it up to this point? No, I don't think so. Oh, it's where you go in one of the paths I didn't take. Next, we go to the Dakota system, where an agricultural colony is suffering an outbreak of Watson's disease and needs... Uh, am I allowed to say the V word without angering the algorithm? You know, it's that thing that you take to protect yourself from infectious diseases. Anyway, it needs to be delivered from off-world. So we gotta protect the transports from Kilrathi raiders. Depending on how well we do that and some other more generic military objectives, the defense system of Planet Hurricane in the Port Headland system will fend off an attack. Or not. Port Headland? Huh. That's another system from a different path. Because we've been doing such a good job so far, we're now on the offensive in the Kurosawa system, attacking enemy supply lines. If you complete every mission perfectly in Kurosawa, you actually go straight to the end game. But this series is the one with the impossible mission where you're supposed to defend a captured enemy carrier, so... Uh, we get a second chance in the Rostov system, where we need to prevent the Kilrathi from enslaving a primitive alien race and ransacking their planet for resources. And hey, the cutscene is actually related to what we've been doing this time. It kind of seems like the cutscenes were made with one particular path in mind. Anyway, since we pulled that off, it's time to finish the job and destroy the Kilrathi's starbase in the Venice system, kicking them out of the Vega sector once and for all. Or they kick us out via the Hell's Kitchen system. Destroying the starbase is basically identical to fighting an enemy capital ship, in case you were wondering. Once you're in either of the ending series, you're actually locked in to either the good or bad ending regardless of what you do from there. You can eject in every mission in Venice and you'll still win the game. I guess Hunter took care of it. Good on you, mate. So, yeah. There seems to be this idea going around that people didn't play Wing Commander for the gameplay. They were there for the story. To be honest though, if we were to only look at Wing Commander 1, it would be kind of hard to see why. Like, what story? There is a plot, which is to say there are events that happen, 
and there are characters, but never the twain shall meet. Neither the player character nor anyone he knows is in any of the story cutscenes where we see people actually doing things. Worse, none of it matters to us. Even if you happen to have been on the right path to be involved with the events depicted in any way whatsoever, this is still a bunch of people we don't know doing something that has no personal relevance to us, and none of it is ever referenced again after it happens. Come to think of it, I don't even have a good sense of where the Vega Sector is in relation to Earth or Kilra, or how big of a deal it is for the Confederation or Empire to have claimed it. I get the idea that this was intentionally left vague so we could focus on the action, but then why should I care what happens to it? In the end, it's all a bunch of dry military objectives to be failed or completed. It provides a believable context for why you're getting into dogfights in space, but barely anything beyond that. They're lucky the action genuinely is good, or I wouldn't have bothered. And then there are the characters. It's obvious that Origin consider them an important part of the game from all the effort they put into them. Coming up with a diverse array of backgrounds and personalities, drawing those detailed animated portraits, custom tuning their AI, implementing permadeath for them. And you know what? It did pay off to an extent. They're a generally likable bunch, and they do stand out, both from each other for the most part, and from what most other games had to offer in 1990. They're nothing special for 2023 though. Having a distinct character outline is nice and all, but that's supposed to be the beginning. Characters are meant to evolve and reveal themselves over time. And that can't happen if you never see them do anything. Occasionally one of your wingmen will tell you about something they did, but hopefully I don't need to remind you of the golden rule of showbiz here. Still, we are talking about a long-running series here, so in a way, this whole game is just a beginning. There's something compelling about following a group of characters over a long series, developing a history with them, and watching them change and grow, even if they do occasionally seem to just morph into an entirely different person between games. Watch this space, is what I'm saying. We're not done yet, though. Not yet, Snake! It's not over yet! If you're looking for more after the main campaign, Origin has you covered with two additional story campaign expansion packs called Secret Missions and Secret Missions 2 Crusade. What I should tell you up front is that you probably shouldn't play these unless you really enjoyed the main game and think you're hot sh if you're worried about missing out on the story for some reason, just watch Secret Missions 1 and 2, the visual novel on YouTube. Just don't make the same mistake I did and believe the internet when it tells you that Wing Commander 2 continues from where Secret Missions 2 leaves off. The hell it does! There are a few events that happened in the Secret Missions they get an offhand reference in 2, but it's nothing you'd even notice was missing if you didn't know about it. You might think they would have taken this opportunity to expand on how the hell we got from here... to here... Without your flight recorder as evidence, the court couldn't convict you of anything but negligence. But I know the destruction of the Tiger's Claw was your fault! But you'd be wrong. Like most expansion packs of this type, they are self-contained stories made with the understanding that only a minority of the people who bought the base game were going to play them. I would say that the quality and ambition of those stories is a genuine improvement over the base game, but we're talking baby steps here. There's a tool for transferring your saves between the base game and secret missions, but the only things to carry forward are your medals and leaderboard stats, so it's nothing essential. You can carry a save all the way from Base Wing Commander 1 to the second game and its expansion content though, which is kind of fun to think about. I bet you could rack up an absolutely ridiculous kill count by the end of all that. Secret Missions 1 starts with the Kilrathi using a mysterious super weapon to totally wipe out a human colony out of nowhere. So it's your job to identify and chase it behind enemy lines to destroy it before it could be used again. This is a good start. Rather than the generic objective of taking control of the Vega Sector, we've got a specific inciting incident that gives the characters a solid motivation for going after the objective, and a specific circumstance to complicate things and add drama. Ooh, we're behind enemy lines. Can we survive on our own? Will we ever make it back to safety? 
as well as a specific overall objective for the campaign to build towards. Figure out what attack the colony, chase it down, and take it out. Specificity is key. And what's this? Is something actually happening to one of the characters? Your fellow pilots have been talking, and they've decided that Maniac is dangerously insane and should be grounded. Which, I mean, yeah, just look at him. Wait, so are we supposed to take his lack of acknowledgement to mean he's not going to ground Maniac? Oh, sorry. False alarm, everybody. It is an improvement, but the story still lacks any twists or turns to hold your interest. It ultimately boils down to, you find out the weapon is on a new kind of capital ship, you chase it down, blow it up, and escape. Just another series of military objectives to accomplish or not. Gameplay-wise, Secret Missions makes zero mechanical changes. You're flying all the same ships with the same weapons against the same enemies, but harder. So how do you make Wing Commander harder without changing the mechanics at all? You cram multiple waves of four or more fighters into every single nav point. Oh, and you give the player a crappy ship. When I was playing these games for the first time earlier this year, Secret Missions defeated me. Every mission was an exhausting meat grinder, and after failing for the 15th time in a row in one of them, I just got fed up and watched the rest of the dialogue scenes on YouTube. Now that I've returned, older, wiser, and with a lot more Wing Commander experience under my belt, I figured I'd be able to take them on this time. And you know what? As long as you're at least as good at Wing Commander as I am now, it's not that bad. The majority of the missions which have you flying in either the Raptor or the Rapier put a smile on my face. Sure, the odds are overwhelming, but that just makes it all the more satisfying when you pull it off, right? What wasn't fun at all was the series around the middle that expects you to beat those same odds in a scimitar. The little ship that couldn't. Getting past those missions took a lot of patience. But once I did, it was back to smooth sailing and a rapier all the way to the end. And don't go thinking you can skip some of those bad missions like you could in the main game. They pared down the branching paths to a linear sequence for the expansion packs. If you don't complete enough objectives, you go straight to the bad ending series. Uh oh, they just blew up the tiger's claw. Wonder what happens if I eject now? Wait, what? But you're... We're on the... You know what? Let's just not question it and move on. Maybe you can skip a mission or two after all. Hey, wanna know one weird trick? Kilrathi hate it. In situations where there are multiple waves of enemy fighters, the next wave won't arrive until the last enemy in the current one is destroyed. So what happens if the last enemy were to instead run away? The next wave doesn't spawn. And if you can't convince the last guy to run, you could just do your business with only one ship on your tail instead of the six that would show up if you destroyed it. You might call this an exploit, and you'd be right. But if you were to make use of it in the secret missions, well, I wouldn't blame you. If Secret Missions 1 was a step up in difficulty from the base game, Secret Missions 2 is, naturally, the next step from there. They actually did add some new stuff this time, though. Drouthy have been given better shields and had their laser cannons replaced with mass drivers to make them less of a joke. The enemies have an even bigger capital ship now, called the Snakier Carrier. It's still the same fight as every other capital ship, but it looks snazzier and takes a bit longer to kill. And most importantly, there's a new enemy superfighter called the Hriss. It's like a Grotha on steroids, with great maneuverability, powerful guns, and shields and armor for days. And finally, many of the fighters of all types that you'll come across get an AI upgrade in the form of elite Drakai pilots. It basically makes aces into a semi-common enemy type. Then combine all that with the usual wave after wave of overwhelming numbers of fighters you've come to expect from the Secret Mission series. I'm not gonna lie, it's pretty rough. On the Confederation end of things, the Scimitar is finally gone! But don't celebrate just yet. In its place, we got a captured Drowthy that you use for stealth missions. 
If you're wondering how stealth works in the Wing Commander 1 engine, it doesn't. The enemies will just attack you like normal. At first I thought my version of the game was bugged, but I was told that no, apparently that's just how it is. The disguise doesn't work, but for some reason you keep trying to use it. The first couple of times they at least give you recon objectives. You wouldn't want to do any actual fighting in this thing, because it turns out a Drowthy is basically identical to a Scimitar in all the ways that matter. <sighs> There's just no escape, is there? Uh, what was I talking about again? Oh. One word of advice I can give is that when the Colonel tells you not to fight something, listen to him. Or if you see something dangerous that you weren't specifically told to deal with, simply don't. Like these assholes who want to fight you in the middle of an asteroid field? Really, guys? Really? No thanks, bro. Just remember to tell your wingman to get in formation with you or send them home if you do this, or look at themselves killed trying to fight everything you left behind. You also get two new wingmen visiting from Wing Commander 2. Jazz is... a jazz pianist. Go figure. And he seems to think pretty highly of himself. Whatever. Doomsday, on the other hand? He's got Maori tattoos, which is interesting. What's not so interesting is his personality. He describes himself as a pessimist. I want you to imagine a pessimist character. Now exaggerate the pessimism. More. Flanderize it. Every single sentence out of this guy's mouth is either doomsaying or a complaint of some kind. I mean, yeah, if you think about it, every wingman just repeats a couple of stock phrases over and over again. But it turns out that when what that amounts to is constant whining, it's way more annoying. It probably doesn't help that he's with you for the worst two missions in the game. First, you need to protect two freighters from an overwhelming enemy force. Pretty normal so far, but try this on for size. What if you had to do it in a Hornet? You know, the under-equipped starter ship that takes forever to kill anything other than the weakest enemies in the game and can be torn to pieces by a single attack from the stronger ones? That Hornet? Try as I might, I could not save that second freighter with my pea shooter. So I thought, hey, this game gives you some leeway with the objectives, right? As long as I ace the other mission in the series, maybe it'll still be okay. And that other mission is to escort another freighter in the Drowthy. So much for stealth. As bad as the Drowthy is, it's still technically more capable than the Hornet. So after many tries, I did manage to bring the freighter home safe and sound. And I'm on the losing path anyway. No leeway after all. And that's where my second attempt at Secret Missions 2 ended. The thought of taking out the entire Kilrathi Armada in record time with a Hornet, then having to do that second mission with the Drowthy again, was too much. I give up. That's the end of my story. I wasn't able to take the pressure, so I chose to put a definitive end to all the madness. I think I owe Doomsday an apology. Turns out he was right all along. It's kind of a shame, because unlike Secret Missions 1, 2 really does bring some new things to the table. And it's cool to see, but it's just so damn hard that when they try to get clever and make you face it all in a garbage ship, it's just too frustrating to bear. They also tried a lot harder with the story in this one. This time you're on a diplomatic mission to meet with a friendly new alien race of bird people called the Fereka. They're not as technologically advanced as the Terrans or Kilrathi, but they could probably find some way to contribute to the war effort, and they'd eventually end up enslaved or killed by the Kilrathi if we don't get involved. So the plan is to form an alliance with them. The Fereka are willing, but the Kilrathi will try to stop us. In fact, they're willing to commit way more resources than is reasonable to stopping us. An absolutely ridiculous amount. Turns out they don't care about the Fereka at all, they just want their planet for a totally unrelated reason. And that reason is... Whoa! Stop the presses! They killed Bossman! I can't believe it! Bossman's dead, you guys! Finally, a character in this game went and did something dramatic. Or had something dramatic happen to them, I suppose. 
Do we get to actually see this happen or be involved with it in any way? Of course not. What game did you think we were playing? Baby Steps, remember? Angel's pretty broken up about it though, seeing as she was flying with him when it happened. They really did try to work some actual plot points into this one, but the problem is that they have to fit the Wing Commander 1 template, which means they're all conveyed to you via the medium of one of your wingmen telling you about it in the bar. One plot point that we actually do get to take part in is the defection of a Kilrathi captain. Captain Ralga wants to join the Confederation, and he's taking his ship with him. So you fly a mission to cover him as he escapes from the rest of his fleet and makes for the Claw. Nice. Once he's safely on board, Ralga tells us why the Kilrathi want the Ferekin's planet so bad. Every few years, their warrior priestesses pick a planet to hold some kind of religious ceremony on. And their planet just happened to be the one this time around. This ceremony is very important to the Kilrathi. It's like a chain letter. If they don't complete it and send it to five new recipients by the end of the week, they'll be cursed with seven years of bad luck. This is very bad news for the Ferekins, because unbelievers won't be tolerated, so everyone on the planet will be forced to convert or die. Then, something even crazier happens. Prince Thrakash sends an ultimatum to all Confederation ships in the area. You have one day to leave. Now we have a named antagonist. Just imagine, finally we can put a face to the enemy, get to know something about their motivations and thought processes, feel some satisfaction when we defeat them. No, I mean really imagine, because you don't get to actually see him. You hear someone else describe what he said. <sighs> Instead of heeding the warning, Halcyon wants to pretend to do it while actually hiding out in a nearby system, then sneaks the marines onto the planet to sabotage the ceremony and kill the priestesses. They manage to pull it off. So, Thrakash sends another ultimatum, specifically to the Tiger's Claw this time. Get out now and I'll let you live, but your marines are toast. Halcyon isn't having any of that, of course, so the plan is to get in, get our boys out of there, then try to do enough damage to the Kilrathi fleet on the way out to force them to leave the planet before they can enact genocide on it. And if you're extremely good at Wing Commander, you might even pull it off. The Ferekins are never seen or heard from again, by the way. They even tease one of the Ferekins as a potential wingman, but nope, forget about him. Actually, it would have made the most sense to have him fly with you in this game. You know, someone who actually has a stake in the conflict? But no, instead we get Jazz and Doomsday, neither of whom has anything in particular to say about Fereka. Oh well. I think it's very telling that when I sat down to write about the story, an actual honest-to-god plot summary came out instead of a one-sentence dismissal. They really did improve the writing here, it's just unfortunate that it's so constrained by its form and it's paired with gameplay so frustrating that only the most skilled and patient players will ever be able to play it to the end. Okay, so let's say you want to play Wing Commander. Which version should you play? The game was very successful for its time, so it was ported to several very different platforms in order to capitalize on that success, resulting in some interesting differences between the various versions. Let's take a look. Starting with Wing Commander for DOS. This was the original 1990 version of the game, making it the standard to compare all other versions to. If you were to buy and play the game now without doing any research, this is also the version that you are likely to end up playing, because it's what you get from GOG and Origin out of the box. It's not the version I would recommend playing though. The first issue is that it's a pain in the ass to get the music to sound right. You need to set up a Roland MT32 emulator with the correct ROM files and then convince DOSBox to actually use it. And that's enough of a boondoggle that I didn't think it was worth banging my head against it enough to get it working for this short overview. Anyway, here's what it's supposed to sound like. And the rest of this section is what it'll actually sound like if you don't spend an inordinate amount of time getting it working. It's not that bad, but I like to play games at their best if I can help it, you know? The real problems start when you climb into the cockpit. 
Remember back when I said the flight controls felt surprisingly good? Well, not in this version. The input resolution is extremely low, so when you start tilting the stick, there's this huge dead zone before the game will register any movement at all. And when it finally does, the starting speed is already pretty high. Then you need to move it significantly further out before it'll go to the next step up in speed, and so on. It ends up feeling really choppy and imprecise, like you're moving in steps. Ka-chunk, ka-chunk, ka-chunk. At least you'll probably have plenty of time to dial in your aim, because like many DOS games from the early 90s, Wing Commander ties its simulation speed to its frame rate and doesn't have a frame limiter. This means the game runs faster as the frame rate goes higher, and there's no canonical game speed. The out-of-the-box experience from GOG will have you constantly raising and lowering the CPU cycles to try and find a speed that feels right, but the problem is that the frame rate is heavily affected by the number of chips on screen, so the setting that works well for a packed dogfight will run unplayably fast when there's only one enemy. If you sub in the newer DOSBox X, you can use a setting to slow down your virtual VRAM, which will allow it to run at a relatively consistent frame rate that is probably close to what the intended speed was supposed to be. But that's when you realize that the intended frame rate must have been very low. I don't have the means to accurately measure it, but I did hear from somebody who would probably know that it was expected to run somewhere around 5 frames per second. And yeah, it looks and feels that way. I don't think of myself as a frame rate snob, but that's a bit low, even for me. One interesting thing to think about is how this works with those clown car missions in the expansion packs. There's no way even top of the line computers at the time would have been able to render all those fighters at the same time at full speed. It must have been a slideshow for most people. So maybe it wasn't so hard to deal with all that crap when you had the benefit of extreme slow-mo. I don't think that would be very fun though. The sound effects are extremely primitive but I have heard some people say they prefer these to the ones in future versions, so your mileage may vary, I suppose. There were versions for other computer standards like the Amiga and the Japanese-only FM Towns, but they're mostly the same other than their soundtracks and not very interesting to me, so I'm just going to lump them in with this version and move on to... The 1992 Super Nintendo port by Mindscape. When I first saw this, I couldn't believe it. How on earth did they manage to get the game running this well on a Super Nintendo of all things? And before the Super FX chip even existed? What's the catch? Well, it turns out there is a catch, and boy is it one! The game makes use of the Super Nintendo's famous Mode 7 feature to scale and rotate the enemy ship you're fighting. Very clever, but here comes the catch. I said enemy ship, not enemy ships. Mode 7 only works on one object at a time. The rest of the processing power is tied up rendering your wingman using an extremely cut down version of the original method. This means that whenever you encounter a group of enemy fighters, they come at you one at a time, and you can't interact with the inactive ones in any way. If that's somehow not enough to stop you, there's also the flight controls. If you thought the controls in the DOS version were choppy, try doing it with a D-pad. Now, they did adjust the turning speed in hurt boxes to make this possible. You can play the game like this, but the better question is whether you would ever want to. And for me, the answer is definitely not. It just does not feel good to fly this way, and that's kind of the primary motivation to play this game in the first place. There's also the small matter of trying to cram all the controls into a SNES controller. A modern gamepad may be able to handle it but eight buttons and no analog sticks just isn't enough. They do make an honest effort. Select is used as a modifier button and they try to group like functions together. So for example, B fires your guns. So select and B cycles between the different guns on your ship. But then you have things like having to press select and R to cycle through multiple screens to get to the communications menu, then select plus X to cycle through the options, then let go of select and press X to pick the option. It technically works, but it ain't pretty. There's no way you're figuring any of this out without reading the manual, and I doubt it'll ever feel natural. Because the SNES is fixed hardware, you don't have to manage the frame rate at least. It's not a particularly good one, and it does fluctuate, but at least you know it's what you're supposed to be getting. Other than all that, it actually does seem to be the entire game, 
or at least nothing I've read indicates otherwise, and I'm not itching to volunteer to be the one to check. There's the usual classic Nintendo censorship, but it's nothing major. They removed all references to alcohol, confiscated Hunter's cigar, and the Blue Devil Squadron is now the Blue Angels. Oh well. This must have been pretty impressive to SNES owners at the time, if nothing else, because it did well enough that they even ported the secret missions over as a separate game. But nowadays, there's no reason why anyone would ever play this for more than five minutes as a novelty unless they had played it as a kid and were nostalgic for it. A couple years later, in 1994, we got the Sega CD port, which was a joint venture between Game Arts, Bits Laboratory, CRI, and 2.5, taking advantage of the Sega CD's scaling and rotation chip to render the ships. Wait, the Sega CD had a scaling and rotation chip? Why? How many games other than this one even used it? Let's follow our mission flishy path and see how it goes. At first glance, it appears to run worse than the SNES version, but there's a reason for that. That's right, none of that one at a time crap in this version. It's the full experience. In terms of content and mechanics, this is the actual game. And it even includes both secret missions campaigns. Or, well, Jazz and Doomsday are in the manual anyway. What, are you gonna try to prove me wrong? Yeah, that's what I thought. Unfortunately, you're still flying with a D-pad, which is an automatic disqualification for me. Also, while there thankfully is support for the 6-button controller, let's pour one out for anybody who tried to play this game with the standard Genesis controller, which features a grand total of four usable buttons. This version does have one unique feature to set it apart, though. Full voice acting. And you know what? It's not half bad. Belly on up, friend, and take a load off. These four Kilrathi Salte came zooming in with the sun at their backs. What's that point, monsieur? There is one, oui? I was leading up to it, lass. The biggest problem I have with it is that there are these occasionally awkward pauses between sentences as the game cues up the next line from the CD. But the actual performances from the actors are good. So in your tail or something. We've got a lot of work to do, people, so let's get to it. The tiger's claw dropped from jump space. Wait a second. Is that. Wow. This is definitely the earliest Cam Clark sighting I've ever had. I wonder if he remembers doing this. The characters are the one feature of the story that still stands up somewhat, so giving them voices actually does add significantly to the experience. So much so that if you do play the game, though I wouldn't recommend actually playing this version, I do think it's worth popping over to a YouTube video of the bar conversations and mission briefings for whatever part you're on instead of watching them in-game. Unfortunately, these videos don't currently include any path other than the winning one, or the secret missions, so you'll have to go without those for now. For the future, it's worth noting that someone is working on a way to get the voice acting from this version running in the PC version, but as of this video, it's not ready yet. It's kind of interesting that they included the intro with the simulator in this version, since you can't choose your name on account of the voice acting. This sequence must have been baffling for anybody who played this without having seen any of the other versions. Origin hadn't decided on a canon name for the main character yet, so your call sign is Hotshot in this one. Probably a better choice than Maverick for a game that also has an Iceman, if you ask me. Also in 1994, we got a remake called Super Wing Commander for 3DO and Mac. I'm not really sure why they never bothered to make a PC version of this, but okay. Now, despite being more technologically advanced than the original game, I actually think this remake holds up worse in several ways. The new graphics for enemy ships make them look really indistinct and hard to tell apart, and the CG backgrounds for interior scenes just look bad. The overall aesthetic just looks less colorful and charming than the cartoony art style of the original, like they were chasing photorealism at a time when they really had no hope of gracefully achieving it. The interstitial animation scenes in particular could sometimes just be really weird. Like, what the hell is this thing? Who would do this? 
Just put it on yourself. I'm shot glass. One aspect of the new graphics that I think does work well is the characters. Although they could deviate quite a bit from the original designs in favor of looking like whichever Hollywood actor they were trying to rip off. Like the Sega CD version, this is fully voice acted, but with a completely different dub featuring a separate cast. And I gotta say, it sucks. These four kill Rathi Salty came zooming in with the sun at their backs. What is the point, monsieur? There is one, and we? I was leading up to it, lad. Hi, Commander. What are we to do if we encounter that enemy? Engage if the odds look good. Let Maverick make the call. Everyone sounds like they're either bored out of their mind or paying more attention to maintaining their accents and how they're actually supposed to feel about the lines they're delivering. The Sega CD version really puts this to shame. They did at least finally settle on Maverick and stuck with it from this point on. Content-wise, Super Wing Commander not only recreates the whole game in both Secret Missions, but also includes a new campaign taking place between Secret Missions 1 and 2 that the community has dubbed Secret Missions 1.5, which has you going after the shipyards that created the super weapon from Secret Missions 1 and attempts to add some foreshadowing for Wing Commander 2. The thing that really puts the nail in Super Wing Commander's coffin for me isn't really its fault. It's that its strange choice of platforms makes it awkward to play nowadays. Emulating an old Mac takes some legwork, but it is possible. The Mac version seems to tie game speed to frame rate, just like the DOS version though, making it hard to find a good balance. What's worse is that I couldn't figure out a way to have my gamepad inputs recognized by the Mac emulators I tried, leaving me with either basically non-functional mouse controls or mapping the arrow keys to my analog stick. Trying to control this game digitally is actually worse than the SNES or Sega CD versions because the turn speed hasn't been adjusted to account for it, making it really hard to draw a beat on enemies. The 3DO version does work if you can wrangle this Russian emulator. It could even emulate the 3DO's flight stick peripheral. If you're dead set on playing Super Wing Commander, this is probably the way to do it, but it's still not perfect. There's something that feels wrong with the flight controls. It's like there's some kind of acceleration or something. I can't really describe it in any more detail than that, but it just doesn't feel as smooth or precise as I would like. The control layout and necessary multi-button combinations to accommodate the small number of buttons available also remains very awkward and confusing compared to what you could do with the PC versions. That's right, PC versions, because there's one final version to talk about. 1996's Wing Commander The Kilrathi Saga is a collection of Wing Commander 1, 2, and 3 ported from DOS to Windows. This is an update of the original version of the game, so just forget Super Wing Commander even existed. Don't worry, the T-Pose machine can't hurt you. It was just a bad dream. First, the good. This is the best controlling version of the game by far. The update to direct input came with a boost in input resolution, removing the choppy feeling the DOS version had and making it feel much more precise, with the end result feeling great. Speaking of chop, the game now runs at a silky smooth 24 FPS, just like the movies. That may not seem like much nowadays, but it's far and away the best you've ever been able to get with this game, so don't knock it too much. This also, crucially, means you don't have to worry about the game running at the wrong speed anymore. You also don't need to worry about getting the music working right, because it's now a recorded arrangement rather than a MIDI, and it's in my opinion the best version of the game's music to date. If you're wondering what it sounds like, well, you shouldn't, because you've been listening to it for most of this video. This is also the soundtrack that I've chose to feature in the music section if the background music was too quiet for you. The Kilrathi Saga also replaces the very primitive sound effects of the DOS version with new ones that I believe are taken from Wing Commander 3. I think they're generally better than the old ones, but if I had one complaint, it would be that they're really loud relative to the music, especially the laser sound. I find myself wishing there was a way to control the volume of the sound effects independently of the music like you can in most modern games. In addition to all that, it adds an option to remove the cockpit while keeping the HUD, so you can finally play in full screen instead of having to view everything through a tiny little window. Now the bad. The conversion was a little sloppy, so some bugs were introduced. 
In the original version, when certain systems were damaged, parts of your cockpit would blow up and your displays would get all staticky. That's all gone in this version. The graphics for planets and other stellar objects in the background are also missing, leaving space looking even more empty than it's supposed to be and making it that much harder to get your bearings. The biggest problem is that, as you might expect of a Windows game from 1996, it doesn't run very well on Windows 10. It's ironic that this version of the game, which was created for the express purpose of future-proofing it, is actually much harder to run nowadays than the original version thanks to the advent of DOSBox. It's a damn shame that what could have been the best version of the game is tarnished by bugs and left inaccessible today is what I would say if it weren't for Wing Commander DX, a mod for the Kilrathi Saga version that fixes all of that stuff. As you've probably figured out by now, this is the version of the game that I played to capture the footage for this video, and the one I recommend for anybody who wants to play this game in 2023. But you might find yourself asking, is Wing Commander worth playing in 2023? As is often the case, it depends on who you are. Did you somehow wander in here from those top 10 lists that seem to be the only other videos about old space sims on YouTube looking for the best one? Then the answer is probably not. As the first of its kind, it's very basic, lacking much of the scale, bombast, and variety of later games in the genre. There are severe limitations to the technology it uses that can compromise the experience, and the game has the occasional frustrating difficulty spike, although the fact that you don't have to complete every objective and mission to win helps. If what you want is the best space sim, no caveats, then Wing Commander is not what you're looking for. Go play, I don't know, Free Space 2. I hear that one's supposed to be pretty good. Now, if you've played a bunch of these kind of games and are looking for another one, or if you're like me and find the prospect of seeing how a genre started interesting, is there fun to be had from Wing Commander? Absolutely. I had always heard that Wing Commander was a story-focused game, while people who care more about gameplay should stick to X-Wing and TIE Fighter, but I found this first one at least a fly in the face of that advice. The story was fairly dull and not really worth experiencing if that's all you're there for. The missions, on the other hand, were full of thrilling dogfights that kept me coming back for more. It's also worth reiterating just how approachable this game actually is. You know what? If you are new to these games, and this seems like it might be a barrier for you, maybe you should start with Wing Commander. You could do a hell of a lot worse. As for how it fits into the genre as a whole, I think it's a damn good start. More than the graphics, what stands out to me is how uncharacteristically playable it is. The quality of life features like the autopilot and navigation systems feel like they fell out of time. You can summon a waypoint marker on your HUD to tell you where to go next at any time. A waypoint marker on your HUD in, and I cannot stress this enough, 1990. I touched on the idea that maybe these games overcomplicated themselves and became too niche to justify their budgets. And that's still under investigation, but one thing I can say is that it wasn't like that in the beginning. There's nothing inherent to space sims that prevents them from being the kind of thing that the average person can pick up and have a good time with. Okay, so there may have been a couple things, but there's nothing inherent to their design that makes them that way. If I can accomplish one thing with this video, I hope it's to get more people to check this game out. It's actually very important historically, not just for space sims, but for PC gaming, and just gaming as a whole. And yet, nobody from my generation or beyond know anything about it. Ask people my age, and you might get a... Those are the games with Mark Hamill, right? If you're lucky. Anybody younger though? They know what Doom is. They played a Mario. But Wing Commander? Nope. Nada. Nothing. And I think that's a shame. Obviously, it's not going to be for everyone. But if you're interested, and if you've watched this far, you probably have a pretty good idea of whether you are or not. 
if you like these kind of games, and even if, like me a few months ago, you just think you might like these kind of games, then please give it a try. I think this might be the longest anyone has gone on about Wing Commander in at least 20 years, counting consecutively at least. Thanks for making it all the way here, assuming you aren't a dirty cheater who skipped to the end. I've got a question for you though. Did you enjoy this video? Did it entertain or inform you? Would you be interested in seeing more like it? Perhaps a similar treatment for other space sims? Well then. I think you know what to do. Perhaps even more importantly than boosting the metrics though, I want you to let me know in the comments. I'm a little new to this whole YouTubing thing. I think it's customary to start by getting in a little over your head, but oh man is that an understatement for the amount of time and effort it takes to make a video like this. Not that I'm complaining, but let's just say the response to this video is going to be instrumental in determining whether or not I try doing something like this ever again. So uh, if you would like to see more, do yourself a favor and tell me all about it. Thanks for watching.